Good evening. This program is made possible in part with funding from the Sullivan County Arts Heritage Grant, funded by the Sullivan County Legislature and administered by the Delaware Valley Arts Alliance. 168 years ago, the world's most renowned abolitionists reproached the country for not including a major portion of its citizenry in the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. He knew then that black lives matter. Ladies and gentlemen, Frederick Augustus Douglas. Mr. President, ladies of the Anti-Slavery Society, friends, fellow citizens. He who could address this audience without a poignant sensation has stronger nerves than I do. I do not remember ever having to appear as a speaker before any assembly more shrinkingly, nor with greater distrust of my ability than I do this day. A feeling has crept over me quite unfavorable to the exercise of my limited powers of speech. The task before me is one which requires much previous thought and study for its proper performance. I know that apologies of this sort are generally considered flat and unmeaning. I trust, however, that uh, mine will not be so considered. Should I seem at ease, my appearance would much misrepresent me. The papers and placards say that I am to deliver a Fourth of July oration. This certainly sounds large and out of the common way. For it is true that I have often had the privilege to speak in this beautiful hall and to address many who now honor me with their presence, but neither their familiar faces nor the perfect gauge I think I have of this Corinthian hall seem to free me from embarrassment. The fact is, ladies and gentlemen, the distance between this platform and the slave plantation from which I escaped is considerable, and the difficulties to be overcome and getting from the latter to the former are by no means slight. That I am here today is to me a matter of astonishment as well as of gratitude, yet you will not therefore be surprised if in what I have to say I evince no elaborate preparation nor grace my speech with any high-sounding exordium. With little experience and with less learning, I have been able to throw my thoughts hastily together, imperfectly, and trusting to your patient and generous indulgence, I will lay them before you. This, for the purpose of celebration, is the 4th of July. It is the birthday of your national independence and of your political freedom. This to you is what the Passover was to the emancipated people of God. It carries your minds back to the day and to the act of your great deliverance, to the signs and wonders associated with that act. This celebration also marks the beginning of another year of your national life and reminds you that the Republic of America is now 76 years old. I am glad, fellow citizens, that your nation is so young. 76 years, though a good old age for a man, is but a mere speck in the life of a nation. Nations number their years by thousands. According to this fact, you are even now only in the beginning of your national career still lingering in the period of childhood. I repeat, I am glad this is so. There is hope in the thought, and hope is much needed under the dark clouds which lower above the horizon. 
The eye of the reformer is met with angry flashes, portending disastrous times. But his heart may well be lighter at the thought that America is young and that she is still in the impressionable age. May he not hope that high lessons of wisdom, of justice, and of truth will yet give direction to her destiny? Were the nation older, the patriot's heart might be sadder and the reformer's brow heavier. Its future might be shrouded in gloom and the hope of its prophets go out in sorrow. Great streams may sometimes rise in quiet and stately majesty and inundate the land, refreshing and fertilizing the earth with their mysterious properties. They may also rise in wrath and fury and bear away under angry waves the accumulated wealth of years of toil and hardship. But while the river may not be turned aside, it may dry up and leave nothing behind but the withered branch and the unsightly rock to howl a sad tale of departed glory. As with rivers, so with nations. Fellow citizens, I shall not presume to dwell at length on the associations that cluster about this day. The simple story of it is that 76 years ago, the people of this country were British subjects. Your fathers esteemed the English government as the home government and England as the fatherland. This home government did, in the exercise of its parental prerogatives, impose upon its colonial children such restraints, burdens, and limitations as it deemed wise, right, and proper. But your fathers presumed to differ from the home government in respect to the wisdom and justice of some of those burdens and restraints. They went so far in their excitement as to pronounce the measures of government unjust, unreasonable, and oppressive, and altogether such as ought not to be quietly submitted to. I scarcely need say, fellow citizens, that my opinion of those measures fully accords with that of your fathers. To say now that America was right and England wrong is exceedingly easy. Everybody can say it. The dastard, not less than the noble brave, can flippantly discount on the tyranny of England towards the American colonies. It is fashionable to do so. But there was a time when to pronounce against England and in favor of the cause of the colonies tried men's souls. They who did so were accounted in their day plotters of mischief, agitators, and rebels, dangerous men, to side with the right against the wrong and the weak against the strong and with the oppressed against the oppressor, feeling themselves harshly and unjustly, tre unjustly treated by the home government, your fathers, like men of honesty and men of spirit, earnestly sought redress. They petitioned and remonstrated. They did so in a decorous, respectful, and loyal manner. This, however, did not answer the purpose. They saw themselves treated with sovereign indifference, coldness, and scorn, yet they persevered. They were not the men to look back. As the sheet anchor takes a firmer hold when the ship is tossed by the storm, so did the cause of your fathers grow stronger as it breasted the chilling blasts of kingly displeasure. The greatest and the best of British statesmen admitted its justice, and the loftiest eloquence of the British Senate came to its support. But with that blindness which seems to be the unvarying characteristic of tyrants, the British government persisted in the exactions complained of. The madness of this course, we believe, is admitted now, even by But we fear the lesson is wholly lost on our present ruler. Oppression 
makes a mad man wise. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Oppression makes a wise man mad. Your fathers were wise men, and if they did not go mad, they became restive under this treatment. They felt themselves the victims of grievous wrongs, wholly incurable in their colonial capacity. With brave men, there is always a remedy for oppression. Just here, the idea of a total separation of the colonies from the crown was born. It was a startling idea, much more so than we at this distance of time regarded. The timid and the prudent of that day were, of course, shocked and alarmed by it. Such people lived then, had lived before, and will probably ever have a place on this planet. Their course in respect to any great change, no matter how great the good to be attained or the wrong to be redressed by it, may be calculated with as much precision as can be the course of the stars. Their opposition to the then, the then dangerous thought was earnest and powerful. But amid all their terror and the frightened vociferations against it, the alarming and revolutionary idea moved on, and the country with it. On the 2nd of July, 1776, the old Continental Congress, to the dismay of the lovers of ease and the worshippers of property, clothed that dreadful idea with all the authority of national sanction. They did so in the form of a resolution. And as we seldom hit upon resolutions drawn up in our day, whose transparency is at all equal to this, it may refresh your minds and help my story if I read it. Resolve that these united colonies are, and of right, ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be dissolved. Citizens, your fathers made good that resolution. They succeeded. And today, you reap the fruits of their success. The freedom gained is yours, and you therefore may properly celebrate this anniversary. The 4th of July is the first great fact in your nation's history. The very rainbow in the chain of your yet undeveloped destiny. Pride and patriotism, not less than gratitude, prompt you to celebrate and to hold it in perpetual remembrance. I have said that the Declaration of Independence is the rainbow to the chain of your nation's destiny. So, indeed, I regard it. The principles contained in that instrument are saving principles. Stand by these principles. Be true to them on all occasions, in all places, against all foes, and at whatever cause, cling to this day, cling to it and to its principles, with the grasp of a storm-tossed mariner to a spar at midnight. The coming into being of a nation in any circumstances is an interesting event, but there were peculiar circumstances which made the advent of this republic an event of special attractiveness. The whole scene, as I look back to it, was simple, dignified, and sublime. The population of the country at the time stood at the insignificant number of three million. The country was poor in the munitions of war. The population was weak and scattered, and the country a wilderness unsubdued. 
There were no means of concert and combination such as exist now. Neither steam nor lightning had then been reduced to order and discipline. From the Potomac to the Delaware was a journey of many days. Under these and in numerous other disadvantages, your fathers declared for liberty and independence, and they triumphed. Fellow citizens, I am not wanting respect for the fathers of this republic. The signs of the Declaration of Independence were great men. They were great men, too, great enough to give fame to a great age. The point from which I am compelled to view them is not certainly the most favorable, and yet I cannot contemplate their great deeds with less than admiration. They were statesmen, patriots, and heroes, and for the good that they did, said the principles that they contended for, I will unite with you to honor their memory. They were peace men, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submissions to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. They believed in order, but not in the order of tyranny. With them, nothing was settled that was not right. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. Now, you may well cherish the memory of such great men. Their solidarity stands out the more as we contrast it with these degenerate times. How circumspect, exact, and proportionate were all their movements. How unlike the politicians of the hour. Their statesmanship looked beyond the passing moment and stretched away in strength into the distant future. They seized upon eternal principles and set a glorious example in their defense. Mark them, fully appreciating the hardship to be encountered, firmly believing in the right of their cause, honorably inviting the scrutiny of an onlooking world, reverently appealing to heaven to attest their sincerity, soundly comprehending the solemn responsibility they were about to assume, wisely measuring the terrible odds against them. Your fathers, the fathers of this republic, did most deliberately under the inspiration of a glorious patriotism and with a sublime faith in the great principles of justice and freedom, lay deep the cornerstone of the national superstructure, which has risen and still rises in grandeur around you. Of this fundamental work, this day is the anniversary. Our eyes are met with demonstrations of joyous enthusiasm. Banners and pennants wave exultingly on the breeze. The din of business, too, is hushed. The ear-piercing fife and the stirring drum unite their accents with the ascending peal of a thousand church bells. Prayers are made, hymns are sung, and sermons are preached in honor of this day. The quick martial tramp of a great and multitudinous nation is echoed back by all the hills, valleys, and mountains of a vast continent, bespeaking the occasion of a nation's jubilee. I need not further enter into the causes which led to this anniversary. Many of you understand them better than I do. That is a branch of knowledge in which you feel, perhaps, a much deeper interest than your speaker. The causes which led to the separation of the colonies from the British crown have never lacked for a tongue. They form the staple of your national poetry eloquence. I remember also that, as a people, Americans are remarkably familiar with all facts which make in their own favor. This is esteemed by some as a national trait, perhaps a national weakness. It is a fact 
that whatever makes for the wealth of the reputation of Americans and can be had cheaply will be found by Americans. Now, I shall not be charged with slandering Americans if I say I think the American side of any question may be safely left in American hands. I leave, therefore, the great deeds of your fathers to other gentlemen whose claims will be less lightly disputed than mine. My business, if I have any here today, is with the present. The accepted time of God and his cause is the everlasting now. We have to do with the past only as we can make it useful to the present and to the future. To all inspiring motives, to noble deeds which can be gained from the past, we are welcome. But now is the time, the important time. Your fathers have lived, died, and have done their work, and have done much of it well. You live and must die, and you must do your work. You have no right to enjoy a child's share in the labor of his father unless your children are to be blessed by your labors. You have no right to wear out and waste the hard-earned fame of your fathers to cover your indolence. The children of Jacob boasted, we have Abraham to our father. Long after, they had lost Abraham's faith and spirit. They contented themselves under the shadow of Abraham's great name while they repudiated the deeds which made his name great. Need I remind you that a similar thing is being done all over this country today? Need I tell you that the Jews are not the only people who built the tombs of the prophets and garnished the sepulchres of the righteous? George Washington could not die till he had broken the chains of his slaves. Yet his monument is built up by the price of human blood, and the traitors in the bodies and souls of men shout, we have Washington to our father. Oh, alas, that it should be so. Yes, so it is. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is oft interred with their bones. Fellow citizens, pardon me. Allow me to ask, why am I called upon here to speak today? What have I or those I represent to do with your national independence? Are the great principles of political freedom and of natural justice embodied in that Declaration of Independence extended to us? <clears throat> am I therefore called upon to bring our humble offering to the national altar and to confess the benefits and express devout gratitude for the blessings resulting from your independence? <laughs> Would to God, both for your sakes and ours, that an affirmative answer could be truthfully returned to those questions. Then would my task be light and my burden easy and delightful. So who is there so cold that a nation's sympathy could not warm him? Who so obdurate and dead to the claims of gratitude that would not thankfully acknowledge such precious benefits? Who so stolen and selfish that would not give his voice to swell the hallelujahs of a nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs? I am not that man. I say it with a sad sense of the disparity between us. I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable distance between us. 
I am not included. The blessings in which you this day rejoice are not enjoyed in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by me. The sunlight that brought life and healing to you has brought strikes and death to me. This 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice. I must mourn. To drag a man in fetters into the grand illuminated temple of liberty and to call upon him to join you in joyous anthems were inhuman mockery and sacrilegious irony. Do you citizens mean to mock me by asking me to speak today? If so, there is a parallel to your conduct, and let me warn you that it is dangerous to copy the example of the nations whose crimes were thrown down by the breath of the Almighty, burying that nation in irrecoverable ruin. I can today take up the plaintive lament of a few and woe-smitten people. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our hearts upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they who wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Above your national tumultuous joy, I hear the mournful wail of millions whose chains, heavy and grievous yesterday, are today rendered more intolerable by the jubilee shouts that reach them. If I do forget, if I do not faithfully remember those bleeding children of sorrow this day, may my right hand forget her cunning, and may my tongue cleave to the roof of my mouth. To forget them, to pass lightly over their wrongs, and to chime in with a popular theme would be treason most scandalous and shocking, and would make me a reproach before God and the world. I shall see this day and its popular characteristics from the slave's point of view. I do not hesitate to declare with all my soul that the character and conduct of this nation never look bleaker to me than on this 4th of July. Whether we return to the declarations of the past or to the professions of the present, the conduct of this nation seems equally hideous and revolting. America is false to the present, false to the past, and false to the future to which she solemnly binds herself. Standing with God and the crushed and bleeding slave on this occasion, I will, in the name of humanity, which is outraged, in the name of liberty, which is Fettered, in the name of the Constitution and the Bible, which are disregarded and trampled upon, I dare to call into question and to denounce, with all the emphasis I can command, everything that serves to perpetuate slavery, the great sin and shame of America. I will not equivocate. I will not excuse. I will use the severest language I can command, and yet not one word shall escape me that any man whose judgment is not blinded by prejudice, or who is not at heart a slaveholder, shall not confess to be right and just. Where all is plain, there is nothing to be argued. What point in the anti-slavery creed would you have me argue? On what branch of the subject do the people of this country 
need light. Must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? That point is conceded already. Nobody doubts it. The slaveholders themselves acknowledge it in the enactment of laws for their government. They acknowledge it when they punish disobedience on the part of the slave. They acknowledge it by putting 76 crimes in the state of Virginia, which if committed by a black man, no matter how ignorant he be, subject him to the punishment of death, while only two of those very same crimes will subject a white man to the same punishment. What is this but the acknowledgement that the slave is a moral, intellectual, and responsible being? The manhood of the slave is conceded. It is admitted in the fact that some statute books are covered with enactments forbidding under severe fines and penalties the teaching of the slave to read or to write. When you can point to any such laws in reference to the beasts of the field, <laughs> then I may contend to argue the manhood of the slave. When the dogs in your streets, when the fowls of the air, when the cattle on your hills, when the fish of the sea and the reptiles that crawl along the land shall be unable to distinguish the slave from a brute, there will I argue with you that the slave is a man. For the present, it is enough to affirm the equal manhood of the Negro race. Is it not astonishing that while we are plowing, planting, and reaping, using all kinds of mechanical tools, erecting houses, constructing bridges, building ships, working in the metals of brass, iron, copper, silver, and gold, that while we are reading, writing, and ciphering, acting as clerks, Merchants and secretaries, having among us lawyers, doctors, ministers, poets, authors, editors, orators, and teachers, that while we are engaged in all manner of enterprises common to any other man, digging gold in California, capturing a whale in the Pacific, feeding sheep and cattle on the hillside, moving, acting, thinking, planning, living in families as husbands, wives, and children, and above all, confessing and worshiping the Christian God, looking hopefully for life and immortality beyond the grave, we are called upon to prove that we are men? Would you have me argue that man is entitled to liberty? That he is the rightful owner of his own body? You have already declared it. Must I argue the wrongfulness of slavery? Is that a question for Republicans? Is it to be settled by the rules of logic and argumentation as a matter beset with great difficulty, involving a, a, a doubtful application of the principles of justice? How should I look today in the presence of Americans dividing and subdividing a discourse to show that men have a natural right to freedom? Speaking of it relatively and positively and negatively and affirmatively, to do so would be to make myself ridiculous and to offer an insult to your understanding. There is not a man beneath the canopy of heaven that does not know that slavery is wrong. Am I to argue that it is wrong to make men brutes? To rob them of their liberty? to work them without wages, to keep them ignorant of their relations to their fellow men, to beat them with sticks, to flay their flesh with the lash, to load their limbs with irons, to hunt them with dogs, hang them from trees, sell them at auction, to sunder their families, knock out their teeth, 
burn their flesh, starve them into obedience and submission to their masters? Must I argue that a system that's marked with blood and stained with pollution is wrong? No! I will not! I have better employments for my time and strength than such arguments would imply. What then remains to be argued? Is it that slavery is not divine, that God did not establish it, that our doctors of divinity are mistaken? There is blasphemy in the thought. That which is a human, inhuman cannot be divine. Who can reason on such a proposition? Come, they that can may do so. I cannot. The time for such argument is past. The American slave trade is especially prosperous just now. In several states, this trade is a cheap source of wealth. It is sustained by American politics and American religion, and the men engaged in the slave trade between the states pass without condemnation, and their business is deemed honorable. Here you will see men and women reared like swine for the market. The many flesh traders perambulate the entire country and crowd the highways of the nation with droves of human stock. You will see them armed with pistol, whip, and bowie knife, driving a company of a hundred men, women, and children from the Potomac to the slave market at New Orleans. These wretched people are to be sold singly or in lots to suit the purchases. They are food for the cotton field and the deadly sugar mill. Mark the sad procession as it moves wearily along and the inhuman wretch who drives them. Hear his savage yells and his blood chilling oaths as he hurries on his affrighted cat. There, see the old man with locks thin and gray. Cast one glance, if you please, upon the young mother, whose shoulders are bare to the scorching sun, her briny tears falling on the brow of the babe in her arms. See, too, that girl of thirteen, weeping, yes, weeping, as she thinks of a mother from whom she has been torn. The drove moves tardily, heat and sorrow have nearly consumed their strength. Suddenly you hear a quick snap, like the discharge of a rifle. The feathers clank and the chain rattles simultaneously. Your ears are saluted with a piercing scream that seems to have torn its way to the center of your soul. The crack you heard? was the sound of the slave whip. That scream you heard was from the woman you saw with the babe. Her speed had faltered under the weight of her child and her chains. That gash on her shoulder tells her to move on. Follow the drove to New Orleans. Attend the auction. See men examined like horses. See the forms of women rudely and brutally exposed to the shocking gaze of American slave buyers. See this grove sold and separated forever. And never forget the deep, sad sobs that arose from that scattered multitude. Tell me, citizens, where under the sun you can witness a spectacle more fiendish and shocking. Yet, this is but a glance at the American slave trade as it exists at this moment in the ruling part of these United States. I was born amid such sights and scenes. To see the American slave trade for me is a terrible reality. When a child, my soul was often pierced with a sense of its horrors. In the deep stillness of the darkest midnight, I have been often aroused by the dread, heavy footsteps and the piteous cries of the chained, 
games that pass our door. The anguish of my boyish heart was intense, and I was often consoled when speaking to my mistress in the morning to hear her say that the custom was very wicked, that she hated to hear the rattle of the chains and the heart-bending cries. I was glad to find one who sympathized with me in my horror. But this murderous traffic is today in active operation in this boasted republic. In the solitude of my spirit, I see clouds of dust raised on the highways of the south. I see the bleeding, the, the bleeding footsteps. I hear the doleful wail of fettered humanity on the way to the slave markets, where the victims are to be sold like horses, sheep and swine, knocked off to the highest bidder. There I see the tenderest ties ruthlessly broken to gratify the lust, caprice, and rapacity of the buyers and sellers of men. My soul sickens at the sight. Is this the land your fathers loved? The freedom which they toiled to win? Is this the earth whereon they moved? Are these the graves they slumber in? But a still more inhuman, disgraceful, and scandalous state of things remains to be presented. By an act of the American Congress, not yet two years old, slavery has been nationalized in its most horrible and revolting form. By that act, the power to hold, hunt, and sell men, women, and children as slaves is now an institution of the whole United States. The power is co-extensive with the star-spangled banner and American Christianity. Where these go, may also go the merciless slave hunter. Where these are, man is not sacred. He is a bird for the sportsman's gun. By that most foul and fiendish of all human decrees, the liberty and person of every man are put in peril. Your broad Republican domain is hunting ground for men, not for thieves and robbers, enemies of society merely, but for men guilty of no crime. Your lawmakers have commanded all good citizens to engage in this hellish sport. Your president, your secretary of state, your lords, nobles, and ecclesiastics in force as a duty that you owe to your free and glorious country and to your God that you do this accursed thing. The right of the hunter to his prey stands superior to the right of marriage and to all rights in this republic, the rights of God included. For black men, there are neither law, justice, humanity, nor religion. The Fugitive Slave Act makes mercy to them a crime and bribes the judge who tries them. An American judge gets $10 for every victim he consigns to slavery. The oath of any two villains is sufficient under this hell black enactment. Sufficient enough to send the most pious and exemplary black man into the remorseless jaws of slavery. His own testimony is nothing. He can bring no witnesses for himself. The minister of American justice is bound by the law to hear but one side, and that side is the side of the oppressor. Let this damning fact be perpetually told. Let it be thundered around the world that in tyrant killing, 
king-hating, people-loving, democratic, Christian America, the seats of justice are filled with judges who hold their offices under an open and palpable bribe and are bound in deciding the case of a man's liberty to hear only his accusers. In glaring violation of justice, in shameless disregard of the forms of administering law, in cunning arrangement to entrap the defenseless, and in diabolical intent, this fugitive slave law stands alone in the annals of tyrannical legislation. I doubt if there be another nation on the globe having the brass and the baseness to put such a law on the statute book. If any man in this assembly thinks differently from me in this matter and feels able to disprove my statements, I will gladly confront him at any suitable time and place he may select. I take this law to be one of the greatest, grossest infringements of Christian liberty. And if the churches and ministers of our country were not stupidly blind or most wickedly indifferent, they too would so regard it. At the very moment that they are thanking God for the enjoyment of civil and religious liberty and for the right to worship God according to the dictates of their own consciences, they are utterly silent in respect to a law which robs religion of its chief significance and makes it utterly worthless to a world lying in wickedness. But the church of this country is not only indifference to the wrongs of the slave, it actually takes sides with the oppressors. It has made itself the bulwark of American slavery and the shield of American slave hunters. They have taught that man may properly be a slave, that the relation of master and slave is ordained by God, that to send back an escaped bondman on his master is clearly the duty of all followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this horrible blasphemy is palmed off upon the world as Christianity. For my part, I would say, welcome infidelity, welcome atheism, welcome anything in preference to the gospel as preached by those divines. These ministers make religion a cold and flinty-hearted thing having neither principles of right action nor bowels of compassion. They strip the love of God of its beauty and leave the throng of religion a huge, horrible, repulsive form. It is a religion for oppressors, tyrants, man-stealers, and thugs. It is not that pure and undefiled religion which is from above and which is first pure, then peaceable, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. But a religion which favors the rich against the poor, which exalts the proud above the humble, which divides mankind into two classes, tyrants and slaves, which says to the man in chains, stay there, and to the oppressor, oppress on. It is a religion which may be professed and enjoyed by all the robbers and enslavers of mankind. It makes God a respecter of persons, denies his fatherhood of the human race, and tramples in the dust the great truth of the brotherhood of man. All this we affirm to be true of the popular church and the popular worship of our land and nation, a religion, a church, and a worship which on the authority of inspired wisdom we pronounce to be an abomination in the sight of God. Bring no more vain appellations. 
the new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies I cannot away with. It is iniquity even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul does hate. They are terrible to me. I am weary to bear them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yet, when ye make prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge for the fatherless. Plead for the widow. The American church is guilty when viewed in connection with what it is doing to uphold slavery. But it is superlatively guilty when viewed in connection with its ability to abolish slavery. Let the religious press, the pulpit, the Sunday school, the conference meeting, the great ecclesiastical missionary, Bible and tract associations of the land array their immune their immense power against slavery and slaveholding. And the whole system of crime and blood would be scattered to the winds. And that they do not do this involves them in the most awful responsibility of which the mind can conceive. My spirit wearies of such blasphemy and how such men can be supported as the standing types and representatives of Jesus Christ is a mystery which I leave others to penetrate. In speaking of the American church, however, let it be distinctly understood that I mean the great mass of the religious organizations of our land. There are exceptions, and I thank God that there are. Noble men may be found scattered all over these northern states who are shining examples, and let me say further, that upon these men lies the duty to inspire our ranks with high religious faith and zeal, and to cheer us on in the great mission of the slave's redemption from his chains. America, your Republican politics, not less than your Republican religion, are flagrantly inconsistent. You boast of your love of liberty, your superior civilization, and your pure Christianity, while the whole political power of the nation is solemnly pledged to support and perpetuate the enslavement of three millions of your countrymen. You pride yourselves on your democratic institutions, while you yourselves consent to be the mere tools and bodyguards of the tyrants of Virginia and Carolina. You invite to your shores fugitives of oppression from abroad. Honor them with banquets, greet them with ovations, cheer them, toast them, salute them, protect them, and pour out your money to them like water. But the fugitives from your own land you advertise, hunt, arrest, shoot, and kill. You glory in your refinement and your universal education, yet you maintain a system as barbarous and dreadful as ever stained the character of any nation. A system begun in avarice, supported in pride, and perpetuated in cruelty. You are all on fire at the mention of liberty for France or for Ireland. But are you as cold as an iceberg at the thought of liberty for the enslaved of America? You discourse eloquently on the dignity of labor, yet you sustain a system which in its very essence casts a stigma upon labor. You can bare your bosom to the storm of British artillery 
to throw off a three penny tax on tea. And yet you wring the last hard earned farthing from the grasp of the black laborers of your own country. You profess to believe that of one blood God made all nations of men to dwell on the face of all the earth. And you have yet commanded all men everywhere to love one another. Yet you notoriously hate and glory in your hatred all men whose skins are not colored like your own. You declare before the world and are understood by the world to declare that you hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And yet you hold securely in bondage a seventh part of the inhabitants of your country. Fellow citizens, I will not enlarge further on your national inconsistencies. The existence of slavery in this country brands your republicanism as a sham, your humanity as base pretense, and your Christianity as a lie. It destroys your moral power abroad, it corrupts your politicians at home, it saps the foundations of religion, and makes your name a hissing to the mocking earth. It is the antagonistic force in your government and the only thing that seriously disturbs and endangers your union. It fetters your progress. It is the enemy of improvement, the deadly foe of education. It fosters pride. It breeds insolence. It promotes vice. It shelters crime. It is a curse to the earth that supports it, and yet you cling to it as if it were the sheet anchor of all your hopes. Oh, oh, be warned. A horrible reptile is coiled up in your nation's bosom. The venomous creature is nursing at the tender breast of your youthful republic. For the love of God, tear away fling it from you, this hideous monster, and let the weight of twenty millions crush and destroy it forever. There is no matter in respect to which the people of the North have allowed themselves to be so ruinously imposed upon as that of the pro-slavery character of the Constitution. In that instrument I hold there is neither warrant, license, nor sanction of the hateful thing. But interpreted as it ought to be interpreted, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. Read its preamble. Consider its purposes. Is slavery among them? Is it at the gateway? Or is it in the temple? It is neither. While I do not intend to argue this question on the present occasion, let me ask, if it be not somewhat singular, that if the Constitution were intended to be, by its framers and adopters, a slaveholding instrument, why neither slavery, slaveholding, nor slave can anywhere be found in it? What would be thought of an instrument drawn up, legally drawn up, for the purpose of entitling the city of Rochester to a tract of land in which no mention of the land was made. Now, there are certain rules of interpretation for the proper understanding of all legal instruments. These rules are well established. They are plain common sense rules, such as you and I, and all of us can understand and apply without having passed years of study in the law. I doubt the idea that the question of the constitutionality or unconstitutionality of slavery is not a question for the people. I hold that every American citizen has a right to form an opinion of the Constitution and to propagate that opinion and to use all honorable form and means 
to make his opinion the prevailing one. Without this right, the liberty of an American citizen would be as insecure as that of a Frenchman. The Constitution, in its words, is plain and intelligible and is meant for the homebred, unsophisticated underlings of our fellow citizens. It is the fundamental law that which controls all others. The charter of our liberties, which every citizen has a personal interest in understanding thoroughly. I take it, therefore, that it is not presumption in a private citizen to form an opinion of that instrument. Now, take the Constitution according to its plain reading, and I defy the presentation of a single pro-slavery clause in it. On the other hand, it will be found to contain principles and purposes entirely hostile to the existence of slavery. I, I have detained my audience entirely too long already. At some future period, I will gladly avail myself of an opportunity to give the subject of the Constitution a full and fair discussion. Uh, allow me to say, in conclusion, Notwithstanding the dark picture I have this day presented of the state of this nation, I do not despair of this country. There are forces in operation which must inevitably work. The arm of the Lord is not shortened. The doom of slavery is certain. I therefore leave off where I began, with hope. While drawing encouragement from the Declaration of Independence, the great principles it contains, and the genius of American institutions, my spirit is also cheered by the obvious tendencies of the age. No nation can now shut itself up from the surrounding world and trot round in the same old path of its fathers without interference. Long established customs of hurtful character could form or defense themselves in and do their evil work with social impunity. Knowledge was then confined and enjoyed by the privileged few, and the multitude walked on in mental darkness. But a change has now come over the affairs of mankind. Wall cities and empires have become unfashionable. The arm of commerce has borne away the gates of the strong city. Intelligence is penetrating the darkness, the darkest corners of the globe. It makes its pathway over and under the sea, as well as on the earth. Wind, steam, and lightning are its chartered agents. Oceans no longer divide, but link nations together. From Boston to London is now a holiday excursion. Space is comparatively annihilated. Thoughts expressed on one side of the Atlantic are distinctly heard on the other. The far off and fabulous Pacific rolls in grandeur at our feet. The celestial empire, the mystery of ages, is being solved. The fiat of the Almighty, let there be light, has not yet spent its force. No abuse, no outrage, whether in taste, sport, or avarice, can now hide itself from the all-prevailing light. The iron shoe and crippled foot of China must be seen in contrast with nature. Africa must rise and put on her yet unwoven garment. Ethiopia shall stretch out her hand to God. And at a time like this scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. Oh, had I the ability and could I reach the nation's ear, I would today pour out a fiery stream of biting ridicule, blasting reproach, withering sarcasm, and stern rebuke. 
the feeling of the nation must be quickened. It is not the light that is needed, but the fire. It is not the gentle shower, but thunder. We need the storm, the whirlwind, the earthquake. The conscience of the nation must be roused. The propriety of the nation must be startled. The hypocrisy of this nation must be exposed, and its crimes against God and man must be proclaimed and denounced. What to the American slave is your 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days of the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty an unholy license, your national greatness sweating vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciations of tyrants, brass-fronted impudence. Your shouts of liberty and equality, howling mockery. Your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy a thin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than there are in this United States at this very hour. Go where you may, search where you will, roam all the monarchies and despotisms of the old world. Travel through South America. Search out every abuse. And when you have found the last, lay your facts by the side of the everyday practices of this nation, and you will say with me that for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy, America reigns without rival. I am sincerely hopeful, earnestly hopeful, that this oration be heard around the world, that my words may do something toward throwing light upon the American slave system, bringing a declaration of liberty to all Americans, hastening that glad day of deliverance to the millions of my brothers in bondage, faithfully relying upon the power of truth, love, and justice for success in my humble efforts Solemnly pledging myself once again to the sacred cause, I subscribe myself, Frederick Augustus Douglass.